The Nutcracker may be on the ballet stage, but democracy is on the docket all over the country. And besides, going to the ballet, it takes hours and hours. You got to dress up and the tickets are really expensive. But you can subscribe for free to Democracy Docket's daily and weekly newsletters. The link is in the upper right-hand corner right now. In almost two dozen states, lawsuits are using Section 3 of the 14th Amendment of the Constitution to challenge Donald Trump's eligibility to run for president. This is Defending Democracy, a weekly podcast from Democracy Docket. We're your hosts. I'm Mark Elias. And I'm Paige Moskowitz. Let's get started. So, Paige, a few months ago, it seemed like every article and podcast and YouTube YouTuber was talking about the 14th Amendment and how it would disqualify Trump from a second term in office. Mark, we were also talking and writing about it. And all of this conversation was happening in anticipation of all of these lawsuits being filed, challenging Trump's eligibility. We now see over 20 lawsuits in 22 states challenging his ability to run for president, given his involvement in the January 6th insurrection. And these lawsuits are really coming from a lot of different people. They're coming from voters, from progressive groups, and a lot of them actually come from a long shot Republican presidential candidate who is challenging Trump's eligibility in federal court in like 14 states alone. Would that be Ron DeSantis? No, even even more of a long shot. John I don't think there is more of a long shot than Ron DeSantis. Ron DeSantis is definitely not going to be president of the United States. And that is probably the only thing that he and I have in common. Well, all of these lawsuits are happening, Mark, and I want to get into that. And our viewers and listeners also have some questions about it. But starting with the basics, what does Section 3 of the 14th Amendment say and why is it relevant in these lawsuits? Yeah, so this is really important because, you know, people tend to focus on some provisions of the Constitution as if they're really important and other provisions of the Constitution as if somehow they're second-class citizens. And Section 3 of the 14th Amendment is every bit as valid as every other provision of the U.S. Constitution. 14th Amendment, one of the most relied upon, most important amendments in U.S. history. Um, And that's the amendment, by the way, that talks about equal protection under the law. A lot of voting rights cases are run under the 14th Amendment. But if you go all the way down to Section 3, what it basically says is that if you were an officer of the United States, then you took an oath as an officer of the United States, and you in, have engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the United States or gave aid or comfort to enemies of the United States, that you're not eligible to hold office. So it was put in place after the Civil War to basically say, if you engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the United States and you had been a member of Congress or a member of the executive branch, um, you could no longer uh, uh, hold office. You are not eligible to run for a new office. You couldn't keep the office you already had. So it seems like it's a pretty clear provision, one would think, in terms of what it means, how it go, how it's applied. But it, all of these lawsuits are actually facing a lot of problems. And I want to focus on three states in particular, Colorado, Minnesota, and Michigan. So in all of these lawsuits, where do they stand? How are they going? Are there issues or challenges that are popping up that may be unexpected? Yeah, so we can talk about the individual states, but let's just first talk about why these challenges have proven tricky. Now, part of it is just, you know, you have a new, you know, a new set of facts to apply. I mean, we've never before had a former president of the United States who, while president, engaged in insurrection. So, you know, like it's kind of a unique set of facts um, that is Donald Trump. We've never before had a president that's been indicted uh, not just once, but four times for conduct relating to um, uh, his time in office, including in federal court for in Washington, D.C., for essentially aiding and abetting and instigating uh, the insurrection that we saw on January 6th. So they're tricky for that reason. But legally, that has expressed itself on in a few different arenas. The first is the question of standing, right? Who has the legal authority to raise the question. Because under our federal system, and in most states, you can't just show up in a courthouse and say, you know, this is an interesting question I'd like you to tell me about, 
support. Um, you know, so will you tell me whether or not Donald Trump is barred from being president, right? There has to be what in the federal law we refer to as a case or controversy. There has to be an actual dispute between the parties. So only someone who is injured by the alleged wrongful conduct can bring a lawsuit. So, so the first thing that that states have been that courts have been grappling with, grappling with is who has standing? Who can say I've been injured by the fact that Donald Trump will appear on the ballot? Um, the second issue um, broadly falls in a very legal term called jurisdiction. But what this really means is, do are courts going to resolve this at all? You know, sometimes you may remember a page from our discussion of gerrymandering claims um, that the U.S. Supreme Court said that it would not recognize a claim for partisan gerrymandering because it was what the court referred to as a political question. In other words, it's a decision for the legislative branches, not for the courts. And that may sound weird because we're used to the courts resolving every dispute that that comes up. But there are a handful of areas where the courts just say, you know what, this is not our decision to make. This is really the decision for another branch of government, typically the legislature to make. And then the final tricky issue that we have to deal with before we get to the merits, right, before we get to the question of whether or not he, in fact, violated the, the, the provision of Section 3, is what's referred to as ripeness, which is, okay, you know, maybe the courts are the right place to resolve this issue, and maybe you're even the right party who has standing, but is this a question that is fully ready for the courts to resolve? Because, you know, maybe, for example, you're bringing this claim now, but maybe Donald Trump never becomes the nominee, and therefore we never have to resolve this issue. And that's referred to as ripeness. So those are kind of the procedural issues that the courts are dealing with, obviously, before you get to the substance. So what are those substantive questions that these lawsuits are trying to answer? All right. So, you know, you said something that I agree with. Um, Page, I always agree with you, very insightful, that um, the text of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment seems relatively straightforward. Um, but nevertheless, uh, the defenders of Donald Trump have made it more complicated, and they have essentially raised three questions. The first, which is a factual question, um, did he engage in an insurrection? Right. I mean, the whole premise of the 14th Amendment is that if you engage in insurrection or rebellion against the United States or gave aid and or gave aid and comfort to enemies of the United States, then you're disqualified. So the first substantive question is, did he, in fact, engage in insurrection or rebellion or give aid and comfort to enemies? Okay, That's sort of question one. The second is, is he an officer? You know, was he an officer? Is being the president of the United States an officer of the United States? Now, that may seem self-evident, but that has been raised as a question. And then the third is, did the oath he took qualify as the kind of oath, because the president of the United States takes an oath of office, is it the, is it the oath that the Section 3 of the 14th Amendment has in mind? So those are kind of the three different buckets that these substantive uh, uh, challenges have been um, sort of centered around once you get beyond the procedure. So when we talk about the actual lawsuits, let's take Colorado. They kind of got over all the procedural questions and got to the substantive questions in the lawsuit filed there. So in Colorado, a state judge has ruled that, yes, Trump did engage in an insurrection. The actions he took on January 6th uh, amount to engaging in insurrection, but she ruled that Section 3 of the 14th Amendment doesn't apply to the office of president, and he didn't take a qualifying oath for Section 3. She ruled on very narrow grounds. You know, Section 3 of the 14th Amendment lists a bunch of offices it does apply to, but it doesn't include president. 14th Amendment says, you know, an officer who takes an oath to, quote, support the Constitution is qualified under the section, but the presidential oath says to preserve, protect, and defend, not support. What do you make of this ruling? Yeah, so I think there's one of two ways uh, to view this. And by the way, the Colorado Supreme Court has already heard argument on this. Um, 
So we're going to get the final word out of Colorado um, in the near future. Um, but the district court judge, the trial judge, there's one or two ways to look at how she, you know, what she was doing here. The first is that she genuinely believes that there is a problem with the oath and or the officer. It, it, the oath thing seems very unlikely to be the, the Donald Trump's saving grace. I mean, there's a, there's a very, very narrow uh, window to say that, uh, that an oath to defend the Constitution is not an oath to support the Constitution. So I, I think that that, that is not um, likely a winner. The officer question has been looked at by a lot of different people, including, by the way, some Federalist Society professors, very conservative people, who point out that obviously he is an officer. Um, he is the chief executive officer. Like in the Constitution, he is in fact the one of the few officers listed. You know, he he holds the office of president, which runs, which is in charge of the entire um, executive branch. So, you know, one way to look at the trial court's ruling is to say that the judge just had a different view of that, um, uh, and you know, I, I, I and that you know. I think the trial judge is wrong. I hope that the Colorado Supreme Court and perhaps eventually the U.S. Supreme Court sees it differently. But that's one way. The other is to say that the trial judge was being a little um, cagier than that or a little more, uh, had a little more foresight than that. And not to say that the judge didn't actually believe what she wrote, but that, that by deciding the question of whether he engaged in insurrection, which, as I pointed out, is a factual question, Right. The question of whether he is an officer or whether he took the oath is a legal question. Right. There's no dispute that he was the president. There's no factual dispute about whether he was the president. There's no factual dispute about whether he took what oath he took. It's on videotape. It's written down like there's no question. But the question of whether he engaged in insurrection requires the court to weigh the underlying conduct where there can be disputes, right? Like, did he mean, you know, did he mean to cause a violent insurrection? Did he intend to only, you know, trigger peaceful protests, right? There's a factual dispute there. And the reason why this is really important, Paige, which is why I'm, I'm belaboring this, is that factual disputes when they are decided by trial courts, are entitled to a lot of deference by appellate courts. So the trial judge's determination after hearing the evidence that he engaged in insurrection, the Supreme Court of Colorado, and for that matter, the Supreme Court of the United States, is bound by that determination. In other words, she has decided that unless they find that her determination was clearly erroneous. Okay, that's the test unless they find that her determination of the facts was clearly erroneous, that issue is decided. Whereas the question of whether he is an officer or took an oath is reviewed under what we refer to as de novo review, which means each court will look at it afresh. So the appellate courts don't have to give any credence to her determination about the oath or officer issues. So in some respects, even though Donald Trump won the battle, he sort of set himself up to lose the war, which is the reason why in Colorado, he also appealed the trial court, right? He's not, it's not just the, the, the plaintiffs who have appealed to the Colorado Supreme Court, but his side has appealed to the Colorado Supreme Court because he doesn't want to live with that finding of engaging in insurrection. So he's looking to overturn that. So the Colorado ruling will get any day now, I expect, uh, and it's definitely one to watch. Mark, and I just want to hammer that point home because it's something we've talked about before that trial courts, district courts, they're the fact finders, right? They are the ones who see all the evidence and make the determination on factual issues and that higher courts are supposed to defer to them. Like you said, we saw this in redistricting cases and other voting rights cases, but it is a really big deal that this judge said that Donald Trump engaged in an insurrection even if she didn't go so far to say that he's disqualified under the 14th Amendment. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And that's why I think the Trump folks, you know, people declare victory. I always say this all the time on social media and, um, and you know, it's one of the great things about Democracy Docket. And by the way, if you've not subscribed to Democracy Docket, now is the perfect time to do it. The link 
to subscribe for free is in the upper right-hand corner. So go ahead and do that right now. Um, but one of the reasons for founding Democracy Docket was to present kind of the full picture, because oftentimes parties will come out and declare victory when they have a trial court ruling. And I always say, don't focus on who's declaring victory, focus on who's appealing, <laughs> right? Because if you really won, you have no reason to appeal. And like I said, both sides are appealing in Colorado because both sides had a loss. And so that loss that the Trump folks are worrying about is real, and we will see how it turns out on appeal. So Colorado grappled with the substantive questions. I want to go back to the procedural challenges in this case, because in Michigan and Minnesota, courts came to different conclusions. Judges there didn't rule on the issue, but they just said it's not ripe yet because the primaries haven't happened. This isn't an issue for primary elections, but new challenges could be filed about Trump's placement on the general election ballot. Can you explain what's happening here? Because everyone seemed very confused by what the judges there said. Yeah, so let's talk about ripeness generally, right? The idea of ripeness is that courts don't want to decide cases that may never materialize into actual problems, right? So, so one of the challenges that courts always face is when is it too early to hear a case? When is the threat of injury just a little bit too remote and that it would be better off to wait to see if the parade of horribles that has been pled by the plaintiffs actually comes into being. And so I think what, what the courts are struggling with with ripeness is they're saying, look, Donald Trump right now is just a candidate. And sure, he could win the primary, but he could also lose the primary. And if he loses the primary, then we courts are never faced with the problem of whether or not he could be president. Because all he's running for right now is to be able to select delegates to a convention, the Republican National Convention, that those delegates then have to nominate him. And only then is he even a candidate for the general election. And so maybe none of that ever happens, the courts think. And we never have to resolve all of these questions about did he engage in insurrection? What is an officer? What is an oath? And we are able to avoid that by simply waiting and seeing how this plays out. So that I think is motivating some of the courts, the ones you mentioned and potentially others, reticence to resolve this question until at least he is um, uh, the nominee and potentially even further than that uh, to say that this is fully right. So let's say that all of this is on pause until Trump is actually the nominee. Let's say he wins the Republican primary. The Republican National Convention is in mid-July 2024. At that point, is that the start date for ripe litigation, quote unquote? Or is it a date further down the line? Is it election day? At what point has Donald Trump gotten further? For, at what point has Donald Trump gotten far enough in the process that courts would then feel ready to step in? Yeah, so this is a great question. And um, at the risk of being too wonky, ripeness is usually referred to as a prudential doctrine. In other words, courts have flexibility to decide how to apply ripeness. You know, other parts of the law are very formalistic. You know, standing, for example, is very, is very formalistic. Jurisdiction is very formalistic. But, but oftentimes, you know, the idea of ripeness is that a judge is to weigh the various considerations. So, you know, there are going to be judges, and I tend to agree with this, who would say, look, it's right now because he is the prohibitive front runner. And as you point out, there will be a narrow window between him getting the nomination and him having to be placed on the ballots. And then you have administrative problems if he's not eligible, determined not to be eligible then. You may deprive, you know, voters of the ability to elect their candidate of choice if he's then de de decided not eligible. So that's like, that's like at one end of the spectrum is you just say, look, as a prudential matter, I'm going to say it's right now. At the other end of the spectrum, you could imagine a judge saying, look, this isn't ripe until he is walking down the stairs on the uh, uh, west face of the Capitol <laughs> and, you know, walking up to the Supreme Court uh, chief justice to take the oath, that's when it becomes right, right? It's not, it's not until after he's elected, essentially, 
because until he's elected, we don't know that we ever have to confront this. So like, let's run the general election and then see what happens. And if he wins, then at that point, you know, then at that point, it's right. That's obviously the other end of the spectrum. Someplace in between would be after the primary, but when he's set to be a general uh, election candidate. Um, and uh, and that that is the point um, uh, that 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 this becomes right. The the problem with all of this, the problem with like all of this for people who are thinking, well, that's crazy. How could you possibly wait until he's a general election candidate? Because what happens if the litigation drags on and then he loses and the Republican Party doesn't wind up with an eligible candidate on the ballot? It's too late for them to reprint ballots or too late under state law for them to replace it. And then they're out of luck. You know, like the problem with all of this is that our constitution assumes good faith actors. And Paige, over and over and over again, we have talked about this on Defending Democracy. Over and over again, I've written about this on Democracy Docket. Democracy Docket has had other guest contributors who have written about this. But our constitution is, by, by normal, by standards of other countries, relatively short, not regularly amended, um, and not particularly prescriptive. It is based on a, a set of assumptions that the political actors in our process will act in good faith, that they will be responsible actors. And so, you know, our system assumes that if you have an indicted candidate, that the party won't nominate. No less a candidate has been indicted four times. That if you have an indicted candidate, they won't run, right? Shame would keep them from running. That if you had an indicted candidate, that the electorate would never elect that person as their nominee, right? I mean, some of what we've seen recently with George Santos actually plays all of this out, right? You actually had Republicans move to expel him and a number of Republicans voted. You had the reality that even if he ran, he would never get the nomination to be a candidate again, right? That's how the political process is set to work under our constitution. Donald Trump is an exception to that because he has no shame. And he's an exception to it because he seeks ways to exploit the normal order of our constitution and the normal um, pageantry of democracy. He weaponizes those things against democracy. And he's not normal because the Republican Party has not just refused to stand up to him, but they bask and celebrate his, his um, indictments. They raise money off of the fact that he engaged in insurrection. They are proponents. They are the pro-insurrectionist party now. And so our constitution is not set up. Our court systems are not set up for this kind of system. The Section 3 of the 13th Amendment assumed that you were going to be kicking people, insurrectionists, out of government. You were going to be disqualifying people out of government and that the people of the United States would be cheering, that the responsible political actors would be celebrating, that the court system would be disgusted by the insurrectionist conduct that we saw. And the problem we have, Paige, is that that is simply not true. And it is what gravely threatens our democracy. You know, Paige, I wrote a piece for Democracy Docket a few, uh, a few days or more than a week now ago um, about um, how Donald Trump is leading the Donald Trump is leading a movement to overturn the U.S. Constitution, to overturn our democracy. OK, and that plot to overturn our democracy will only take place if enough people allow it to happen. And so what we are seeing right now is enough people enabling that to happen. And we need the courts here in this instance to step up. Mark, if you're the RNC, what do you want to happen? Do you are you you're taking a calculated risk that your front runner may not be eligible to be president? Do you want the courts to step in early? Do you want them to hold off? Do you want them to rule that that's not an issue for them at all? It's up to lawmakers, and you know that Congress wouldn't vote him ineligible. If you're the RNC, what is your game plan here? So, Paige, this is the um, the never-ending debate going on right now um, in politics. Um, and I think we've heard it from some of our guests, frankly. We heard it from... Uh, 
um, Congresswoman Crockett from Texas, you know, where I asked her, do the Republicans in the, like your colleagues, do they believe this stuff? So if you remember sort of what she said was, you know, like, yeah, off camera, <laughs> you know, when they're not in public, some of them do recognize this is a real problem. And I think that that's true within the RNC. I think that there is like what the RNC thinks in their heart of hearts, which is they'd like Donald Trump to just go away. Um, and if he's going to be here, they'd like this to be resolved sooner rather than later so that if he's not going to be the nominee, they can nominate Rick, Nikki Haley or, or you know, um, uh, someone. I don't know. It won't be DeSantis. He's not winning, but it'll be someone. Um, but on the other hand, they are unwilling to say that out loud. They are political cowards. You know, if you read John Kennedy's um, work about profiles and courage, it talks about the essential nature of politicians being feared, fearful of being shamed and therefore exercising political courage. Rona McDaniels is, has no shame left. She's not fearful of being shamed. The RNC is not fearful of being shamed. The speaker is not fearful of being shamed. They have no shame. And when you're shameless, this dichotomy becomes very, very dangerous. You know, but for people who have not read it, um, we'll put a link to the piece I wrote about um, Profiles in Cowardice, it's called, about the Republican Party. We'll put that in the notes. And um, uh, you can also make sure that if you click on the link in the upper right-hand corner, you'll be subscribed. You'll be able to subscribe to Democracy Doc and to make sure that as pieces by me and other people on these topics come out, you'll be able to um, you'll be able to get for free. So, Mark, it's clear that no matter what happens, this is going to turn into a big legal mess. Going to a question of procedure. Is this a process that goes state by state for determining Trump's eligibility or is it kind of all at once? Like, could Trump end up disqualified in Michigan, but qualified in Wisconsin? Yeah, great question. So obviously the litigation will be state by state. You know, every state has its own ballot access laws, its own election rules, as you as you know, you and the democracy docket team know too well. Every state kind of has its own take on things. But I do think that since this is a question of national importance, and it wouldn't make sense for there to be one standard for insurrection or officer in one state and a different in another state, I do think that this will almost certainly go to the U.S. Supreme Court, and the U.S. Supreme Court will have to make a a, a fundamental decision whether or not um, Donald Trump is disqualified under Section Three of the Fourteenth Amendment. And I just want to come back to, you know, the reason why that trial court determination on the facts of insurrection are so important, because though the conservatives on the Supreme Court will, from time to time, impose that clear error. Uh, review, they will say, well, we think it was clearly erroneous. We think the conduct was not an insurrection. That's that's possible. Um, it certainly um, uh, puts the forces uh, trying to apply the 14th Amendment to Donald Trump in the driver's seat if that determination of fact stands. Um, but I think one way or the other, this probably winds up in the U.S. Supreme Court. And I know, if I know anything, I know that um, Democracy Docket will cover that more closely and in more in depth and more timely than anyone else. We'll definitely keep an eye on it. Um, another question, Mark, just about procedure going up to SCOTUS, so it's clear for everyone, it can go to SCOTUS from any one of these cases, right? It could go from a state Supreme Court like Colorado to SCOTUS. It doesn't have to be one of the federal lawsuits, right? So Paige, this is a question we get all the time. I get it all the time. Democracy Docket, as you know, gets it all the time. In fact, there's a great explainer that um, Democracy Docket has um, that uh, we'll make sure are in the are in the show notes. Um, but yes, um, you can appeal a case either from the highest court of a state. So in this case, the Colorado Supreme Court or the you know, Minnesota Supreme Court, I mean, pick your state, right? You get on a, on a question of federal constitutional law that can either go up through the state system where the states opine on federal constitutional law, and then you appeal from the state Supreme Court to the highest, uh, to the, uh, to the U.S. Supreme Court, or the case can start in a federal district court, go to a federal court of appeals, and then be um, appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court. Either is fine, either way the Supreme Court uh, can rule, uh, but the case does not need to go up through one system and then back down to the other. It goes directly from either a court of appeals to the U.S. Supreme Court or from, um, from, uh, from the state Supreme Court uh, to uh, the U.S. Supreme Court. 
we just spent the past like half hour talking about how a front runner for president may be ineligible for president because he instigated or was involved in an insurrection against the United States. What are your thoughts about how we just ended up in this situation? And what does it say about American democracy? American democracy is fragile. American democracy is buckling under the weight of going on now um, seven or eight years of nonstop attacks from Donald Trump and from the Republican Party, his now full co-conspirators and enablers. You know, whatever people may have thought that there was a wing of the Republican Party standing up to Trump, that wing simply doesn't exist anymore. It has been either driven from the Republican Party or it didn't ever exist. But one way or another, you know, it is now fully the party of Donald Trump, and it is attacking democracy every single day. As I mentioned, I wrote a piece recently about the plot to undermine and to overturn American democracy that's on Democracy Docket. Democracy Docket has covered this over and over again through its commentary, through our podcasts, and through, um, uh, through its news. The Republican Party has made a fundamental decision that they are going to move forward with Donald Trump as their nominee. They have made the assessment that they will live with being the party that may go down in history as having not just attacked, but having successfully attacked American democracy. They, they have embraced the January 6th insurrection, not as a point of shame, but as a point of pride. They are moving forward with full knowledge that they are taking the risk, that they are having him on the ballot, that he could be convicted. He could be a felon, a convicted felon in federal court and potentially in state court by the time he is, um, uh, by the time we reach election day. Paige, they've taken all of that risk. They've taken it knowingly. They've taken it intentionally. And Paige, they now celebrate. They celebrate it. You know, the number, uh, the, the, the person second in line to the President of the United States, the Speaker of the House, is the, was the most culpable federal elected official uh, for January 6th. They made him Speaker. I wrote about that also. We'll put that in the show notes. People need to understand just how internalized they have taken the risks of Donald Trump, the risks to their reputations, the risks to their, to their legacies, the risks to their ballot, the risks to the country, the risks around the world. They have embodied all of those risks, and they've said they're okay with it. And so we who care about democracy and care about the future of this country need to understand what we are up against. We need to understand that. And that is the reason why the work that you do, the work that your team does is so important because every single day, the team at Democracy Docket highlights those risks and it highlights the things that everyday Americans can do to fight back. Because, you know, Paige, the question we always got a lot when we did spaces, I remember those days on Twitter before Elon Musk. Back in, back um, in yeah, the question we always got the most, and I'm sure we'll get this in the comments on YouTube, um, are what can I do? You know, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not, I'm not, I don't have a, you know, I'm not, I'm not democracy dog. What can I do? And there's something for everyone to do. And so one of the greatest things I think that democracy docket does is it empowers people. It tells them what to do. You know, in virtually every newsletter, um, at the end of every week, there is a section. What are we doing? What are we doing? And it's not just what we democracy are doing. It's what, it's what we as a, as a movement, what we as concerned citizens, what we as people who care about the future for our children and our children's children, it is what they can be doing. So, you know, that's what gives me hope, but that's where the Republican Party is. And so we just need to keep um, plowing ahead and making sure that people are subscribed to democracy. Thanks for listening to Defending Democracy. You can find all of the cases and the articles we mentioned today linked in the description of this episode. If you enjoyed today's episode, please leave us a review. And to find out more and stay up to date on the latest voting rights and election news, visit democracydocket.com and subscribe to our daily and weekly newsletters. We'll see you next time. Today's episode was produced by Alexa Rothenberg, Gabri Corporal, and Paige Moskowitz. It was edited by Paige Moskowitz. Defending Democracy is a production of Democracy Docket, LLC.